Weekly Standard founder and Twitter enthusiast Bill Crystal has helped launch a venture you probably never heard of. It's called Hamilton 68, and it's designed, they claim, to combat Russian disinformation on Twitter. But it's having a bit of a hard time and seems to be spreading disinformation of its own. For example, Hamilton 68 was behind the claim that the release the memo campaign to expose FISA abuse by the FBI was just a Russian plot with no support from actual Americans. Glenn Greenwald has been covering this. He writes The Intercept. He's a critic of widespread hysteria on this question, and he joins us tonight. Glenn, I was, this is one of those many stories that fall through the cracks in a news environment like this, and that's why I'm grateful you uh, have been on this. What is Hamilton 68, and what has it done? So I wrote about it when it was formed not even a year ago, uh, last summer, because it was yet another example, probably the most vivid one yet, of this kind of union between Democrats on the one hand and neocons on the other. I guess I should yes. say reunion, since neocons began as Democrats, migrated to Republicans uh, and are now back with Democrats again. And it was it's essentially a group um, that was, as you said, started by people like Bill Kristol, people who um, have been leading neocons from both political parties, CIA officials, the people who basically have been disseminating disinformation throughout the entire war on terror, the least reliable, most warmongering people in Washington. And they said that the purpose of their group was to combat uh, disinformation and the attack on the American democracy by Russia and other groups. Um, and their main kind of feature was that they would have this dashboard called Hamilton 68 that purported to track the activity of Russian influencers on Twitter by tracking 600 accounts. Nobody knows which accounts they've designated as influencer of, uh, of Russia. Um, they're not necessarily Russian. They're just people who, in the eyes of Bill Crystal and his friends, are people who espouse Russia or pro-Russia themes. And they just constantly make claims about what Russia is doing on Twitter that the U.S. media, in the most shocking way, uncritically ingest and puts into their headlines as fact about what, what, what Russia is doing. So they're basically running their own propaganda campaign purportedly designed to combat propaganda. What's the agenda behind this? I'm a little confused by it. There, it's twofold. Um, one is, these are the people who have actually been obsessed with the idea that we should be to, at war with Russia for forever. Um, back in 2008, when the president of Georgia attacked two provinces um, that viewed themselves as more aligned with Russia, and the Russians went and confronted the Georgian government about it, um, people like John McCain and Marco Rubio and that whole neocon crowd, Bill Crystal, yeah. were essentially calling for NATO to go to war with Russia over Georgia. Um, they've been obsessed with Russia forever and have wanted the reinvigoration of a new Cold War. Um, that's part of it. And then the second part is domestic, which is that whatever views they dislike like, namely on the left wing of the party that's anti-imperialism and anti-war, the left wing of the Democratic Party, or the kind of isolationist, paleoconservative wing or libertarian wing of the Republican Party, they want to smear as being aligned with the Kremlin. So yes. whatever views are on the right wing of the party, like release the memo, or on the left wing of the party, um, like, you know, anything relating to Bernie Sanders, they'll just declare to be a theme of Russia and then accuse everybody who advocates it, Americans who advocated on Twitter, of being part of a Kremlin disinformation campaign. <laughs> you and I are on different sides, and we both had that happen to us, so we know firsthand. Thank you, Glenn. It didn't take long from the birth of the World Wide Web for the public to start using this new medium to transmit, collect, and analyze information in ways never before imagined. The first message boards and clunky Web 1.0 websites soon gave way to the blogosphere. The arrival of social media was the next step in this evolution, allowing for the formation of communities of interest to share information in real time about events happening anywhere on the globe. But as quickly as communities began to form around these new platforms, governments and militaries were even quicker in recognizing the potential to use this new medium to more effectively spread their own propaganda. Their goal? To shape public discourse around global events in a way favorable to their standing military and geopolitical objectives. Their method? The weaponization of social media. This is the Corbett Report. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram, Reddit. Social media as we know it today barely existed 15 years ago. 
Although it provides new ways to interact with people and information from all across the planet, virtually instantaneously and virtually for free, we are only now beginning to understand the depths of the problems associated with these new platforms. More and more of the original developers of social media sites like Facebook and Twitter admit they no longer use social media themselves and actively keep it away from their children. And now, they are finally admitting the reason why. Social media was designed specifically to take advantage of your psychological weaknesses and keep you addicted to your screen. You know, if the, if the thought process that went into building these applications, Facebook being the first of them to really understand it, that thought process was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. And that means that we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while um, because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever. And that's going to get you to contribute more content. And that's going to get you, you know, more likes and comments. I mean, it's, a, it's, a val it's a social validation feedback loop that, that it's like a, I mean, it's exactly the kind of thing that a, that a hacker like myself would come up with because you're exploiting a vulnerability in, in human psychology. And I just, I, th I think that we, you know, we, the inventors, creators, you know, and it's, it's me, it's Mark, it's the, you know, Kevin Systrom at Instagram, it's all of these people, um, understood this consciously and we did it anyway. It should be no surprise, then, that in this world of social media addicts and smartphone zombies, the 24-7 newsfeed is taking up a greater and greater share of people's lives. Our thoughts, our opinions, our knowledge of the world, even our mood, are increasingly being influenced or even determined by what we see being posted, tweeted, or vlogged. And the process by which these media shape our opinions is being carefully monitored and analyzed not by the social media companies themselves, but by the U.S. military. When the world's largest social media platform betrays its users, there's going to be outrage. The study to see whether Facebook could influence the emotional state of its users on that news feed. It allowed researchers to manipulate almost 700,000 users' news feeds. Some saw more positive news about their friends, others saw more negative. Well, I'm not surprised. I mean, we're all kind of lab rats in the big Facebook experiment. But it wasn't only Facebook's experiment. Turns out the psychological study was connected to the U.S. government's research on social unrest. This is really kind of creepy. Yeah. Yeah. And it gets worse. What you may not know is that the U.S. Department of Defense has reportedly spent roughly $20 million conducting studies aimed at learning how to manipulate online behavior in order to influence opinion. The initiative was launched in 2011 by the Pentagon's Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, otherwise known as DARPA. The program is best described as the U.S. media's effort to become better at detecting and conducting propaganda campaigns via social media. Translation, when anti-government messages gain ground virally, Washington wants to find a way to spread counter-opinion. The DARPA document that details the Pentagon's plans for influencing opinions in the social media space is called Social Media in Strategic Communication. DARPA's goal, according to their own website, is to develop tools to help identify misinformation or deception campaigns and counter them with truthful information. Exactly what tools were developed for this purpose and how they are currently being deployed is unclear, but Rand Walsman, the program's creator, admitted last year that the project lasted four years, cost $50 million, and led to the publication of over 200 papers. The papers, including incorporating human cognitive biases in a probabilistic model of retweeting, structural properties of ego networks, and sentiment prediction using collaborative filtering make the thrust of the program perfectly clear. Social media users are lab rats being carefully scrutinized by government-supported researchers, their tweets and Facebook posts and Instagram pictures being analyzed to determine how information spreads online and, by implication, how the government and the military can use these social media networks to make their own propaganda go viral. As worrying as this research is, 
It pales in comparison to the knowledge that governments, militaries, and political lobby groups are already employing squadrons of keyboard warriors to wage information warfare in the social media battle space. The Pentagon's got a new plan to counter anti-American messages in cyberspace. It involves buying software that will enable the American military to create and control fake online personas. Fake people, essentially, who will appear to have originated from all over the world. The plan is being undertaken by CENTCOM, U.S. Central Command, and the objective of the online persona management service is to combat enemy propaganda by influencing foreign social media websites. CENTCOM has hired a software development company called Intrepid, and according to the contract, the California-based company will initially provide 50 user licenses, each of which would be capable of controlling up to 10 fake personas. U.S. law forbids the use of this type of technology called sock puppets against Americans, so all the personas will reportedly be communicating in languages like Arabic, Persian, and Urdu. So is it okay to have the government monitor social media conversations and then to wade in and correct some of those conversations? With more on this, let's go to technology expert Carmi Levy. He's on the line from Montreal. Carmi, uh, do you think the government's monitoring what you and I are saying right now? Is this whole thing getting out of line or what? It opens up a bit of a, a, bit of a question. I'd like to call it a Pandora's box of, uh, you know, what, is the, what exactly is the government's aim here? And what do they hope to accomplish with what they find out? And as they accumulate this information online, this data on us, um, um, you know, where does that data go? Uh, and so, you know, I think uh, as much as we should applaud the government for getting into this area, the optics of it are potentially very big brother-ish. Mm-hmm. Um, and the government really does need to be uh, a little bit more uh, concrete uh, on what its intentions are and how it, how it intends to uh, achieve this. New evidence that government-owned computers at the Army Corps of Engineers office here in New Orleans are being used to verbally attack critics of the Corps comes in an affidavit from the former editor-in-chief of NOLA.com. John Donnelly, who was laid off this past February, tells us via satellite from Texas, in late 2006, he started noticing people presenting themselves as ordinary citizens, defending the Corps very energetically. What stuck out, though, was the wording of the uh, comments was in many ways mirroring news releases from the Corps of Engineers. These commenters uh, tried to discredit uh, these people. And when Rosenthal investigated, she discovered the comments were coming from users at the Internet provider address of the Army Corps of Engineers offices here in New Orleans. She blamed the Corps for a strategy of going after critics. In the process of, of, of trying to obscure the facts of the New Orleans floodings, one of their tactics was just verbal abuse. Moetzet Yesha, in conjunction with My Israel, uh, has arranged an uh, instruction day for wiki editors. The goal of the day is to um, teach people how to edit in Wikipedia, which is the number one source of information today in the world. As a way of example, if someone searches the Gaza flotilla, we want to be there. We want to be the guys who influence what is written there, how it's written, and to ensure that it's balanced and uh, Zionist in nature. These operations are only the visible and publicly admitted front of a vast array of military and intelligence programs that are attempting to influence online behavior, spread government propaganda, and disrupt online communities that arise in opposition to their agenda. That such programs exist is not a matter of conjecture. It is mundane, established, documented fact. In 2014, an internal document was leaked from GCHQ, the British equivalent of the NSA. The document, never intended for public release, was entitled The Art of Deception, training for a new generation of online covert operations, and bluntly stated that we want to build cyber magicians. It then goes on to outline the magic techniques that must be employed in influence and information operations online, including deception and manipulation techniques like anchoring, priming, and branding propaganda narratives. After presenting a map of social networking technologies that are targeted by these operations, The document then instructs the magicians how to deceive the public through attention management and behavioral manipulation. That governments would turn to these strategies is hardly a shocking development. In fact, the use of government chills to propagate government talking points and disrupt online dissent 
has been openly advocated on the record by high-ranking government officials for the past decade. In 2008, Cass Sunstein, a law professor who would go on to become Obama's information czar, co-authored a paper entitled Conspiracy Theories, in which he wrote that the best response to online conspiracy theories is what he calls cognitive infiltration of groups spreading these ideas. Government agents and their allies might enter chat rooms, online social networks, or even real space groups and attempt to undermine percolating conspiracy theories by raising doubts about their factual premises, causal logic, or implications for political action. In one variant, government agents would openly proclaim or at least make no effort to conceal their institutional affiliations. In another variant, government officials would participate anonymously or even with false identities. It is perhaps particularly ironic that the idea that government agents are actually and admittedly spreading propaganda online under false identities is, to the less informed members of the population, itself a conspiracy theory rather than an established conspiracy fact. Unsurprisingly, when confronted about his proposal, Sunstein pretended to not remember having written it and then pointedly refused to answer any questions about it. My name is Bill DeBerg from Brooklyn College, and I know you wrote many articles, but I think the most telling one about you is the 2008 one called Conspiracy Theories, where you openly advocated government agents infiltrate activist groups of not love truth and also stifle dissent online. I was wondering, why do you think it's the government's job, or why do you think the government should uh, go after family members who have questions about 9-11, responders who are lied to about the air, survive, survivors whose testimony commits, and also government whistleblowers that were gagged because they released information that contradicts the official story. Why do you think the government should do that? I, I think, as, as Ricky said, I've written hundreds of articles, and I remember some and not others. That one I don't remember very well. I, I, I hope I didn't say that. Um, but whatever was said in that article, my role in government is um, to oversee federal rulemaking in a way that is uh, uh, wholly disconnected from the vast majority of my academic writing, including that. I just want to know, is it safe to say that you retract saying that conspiracy theories should be banned or taxed for having an opinion online? Is it safe to say that? that or, I don't remember the article very well, yeah. so uh, I hope I didn't say either of those things. But it, you did, and, I, and it's written. Do you retract them? I'm focused on my jobs. Now, a decade on from Sunstein's proposal, we know that military psyops agents, political lobbyists, corporate shills, and government propagandists are spending vast sums of money and employing entire armies of keyboard warriors, leaving comments and shaping conversations to change the public's opinions, influence their behavior, and even alter their mood. And they are helped along in this quest by the very same technology that allows the public to connect on a scale never before possible. Technology is always a double-edged sword, and sometimes it can be dangerous to wield that sword at all. There are ways to identify and neutralize the threat of online trolls and shills, but the phenomenon is not likely to go away anytime soon. Each of us must find our own answer to the question of how best to incorporate these technologies into our life. But the next time you find yourself caught up in an argument with an online persona that may or may not be a genuine human being, it might be better to ask yourself if your efforts are better spent engaging in the argument or just turning off the computer. We are honored to be joined by Daniel McAdams, who I'm sure a lot of my ad audience will know as the co-host of the Ron Paul Liberty Report with, of course, Dr. Ron Paul at the Ron Paul Institute. Uh, Mr. McAdams, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. It's great to be with you, James. Thanks for inviting me on. Well, as I say, I'm sure a lot of my audience will already be familiar with the Ron Paul Liberty Report and the work that you're doing there. Uh, and if you're not, please do subscribe to that channel and watch uh, on a daily basis as you go through the foreign policy stories and other stories that actually matter in American politics. But of course, do so in the knowledge that when you do so, you will be supporting Russian propagandists and trolls. Of course, <laughs> as right. we all know, the big Russiagate narrative uh, busted out in the last couple of years has identified the Ron Paul Institute as a major source of Russian propaganda, along with the Corbett Report, which of course also made that prop or not list a couple of years ago by the anonymous cowards 
who will not say anything about their methodology or why they are label, uh, trying to label people as traitors and treasonous and all of this. Um, but I think we know the story behind it. And just to add an interesting piece to this puzzle, recently on the Ron Paul Liberty Report, Dan, you were covering behind the State Department's $40 million troll farm, talking about something called the Global Engagement Center. Tell us what we know about this Global Engagement Center and the work that it does. Well, like most evil things, I think, in the U.S. government, it came about ultimately through the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act. As, as you no doubt remember, James, that gave us uh, targeted assassinations of American citizens, uh, uh, de uh, unlimited detention without trial, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this was an initiative by the Obama administration to primarily at the time to counter uh, jihadist propaganda, because we were all, as you know, rushing James to fight the jihad uh, <laughs> without. And when the State Department said, hang on, uh, stop doing that. And we said, oh, OK, we get it now. But um, but seriously, that was the idea, uh, you know, to, to counter ISIS propaganda and counter Al Qaeda propaganda. Uh, but now, you know, uh, with the new with the new defense strategy that uh, that Secretary Mattis uh, put out earlier this year, we have realized now that. Actually, you know, this past 13 years or so of fighting uh, Al Qaeda, uh, we're not doing that anymore. Now the enemy is China and Russia. And so the uh, this global engagement center has got a shot in the arm because, surprise, surprise, the Pentagon has given it a financial shot in the arm in the to the tune of an additional $40 million uh, to primarily focus on countering Chinese and Russian propaganda. Yes, and just to point out the irony there for anyone that uh, that may have uh, alluded, the idea that this was created to counter ISIS and Al-Qaeda terrorist propaganda and is now being used against those dastardly Russians is particularly funny, in or ironic at least, in the sense that, of course, it was the Russians and the Syrians and the Ura Iranians and Iraqis who were responsible for routing and, and getting rid of ISIS. So... That that I mean I think the irony there shouldn't be lost on anyone. But let's let's get deeper into the woods here. So what does it mean that the State Department is going to be attempting to or is already countering propaganda online? What form does that take, and what does that imply for uh, the information that or disinformation that we're seeing in the online space? Well, I think for a few reasons we should find it extremely chilling. First of all. What qualifications does the State Department or any government agency have to determine what is foreign propaganda? If I'm a person in the State Department and I'm involved in a particular U.S. government policy, say it's uh, support for a certain political party in, in Eastern Europe or something uh, or opposition to, and there's a, a media outlet like the Corbett Report or somewhere else that's skeptical about this, uh, you're countering – uh, you're going. You're opposing a State Department policy. Uh, therefore, you could easily be labeled pushing foreign propaganda. Uh, after all, the Russians may also agree with you that this party or this movement is good or bad. So the whole idea that there's a government agency out there that will determine not which not which other government entities, but which private entities, American entities, American alternative news sources. If we disagree with the State Department line, well, we're opposing. American policy. Therefore, we're propagandists and we need to be countered by our own government. That, If that's not chilling, I, I don't know what is. It, it, it's the, the definition of chilling, in, in my opinion. But at least there's the fig leaf that, well, you're, you're Americans in America, so theoretically the State Department can't really be doing anything against you, right? It's only against foreign propagandists like Canadians in Japan, like myself. Well, you can be you can be slimed, you can be slammed, you can be defamed, you can be as prop or not. We don't know what their source is. We don't know if they're a bunch of CIA guys. We have no idea who they are, uh, but they call us Russian propagandists. They hurt our bottom line. You know, as Trotsky said, uh, to oppose the state is to die of slow starvation. You know, that's how they kill you. They kill your ability to make a living doing what you're doing, and that is what they're doing. And look at the major. Uh, media companies, the major social media companies, Google is in bed with the Pentagon. Amazon is in bed with the Pentagon. Uh, you know, Facebook is, has close ties to the government. So they can use these tools to simply make us disappear, to put us in a virtual gulag. 
And, and James, I don't know about your numbers, but frankly, I'll be honest with you, our numbers have, have significantly declined this year. And it's not because we're putting out less cutting edge material. If anything, I think we're doing better than ever uh, telling the truth about our U.S. foreign policy. Uh, but somehow something is happening with algorithms. Uh, I don't know what it is. Uh, but we are being uh, shadow banned, uh, and uh, I think we can attribute it to U.S. government involvement. Yes. Well, I can attest, yes, the Corbett Report, and I know other sites that were on that proper not hit list um, have been targeted and are absolutely losing Google search traffic. And that is continuing as they continue to adjust their algorithms. None of this should be particularly surprising to my viewers who I hope recently saw my recent report on the weaponization of social media and the admitted use of uh, governments and militaries around the world, a use of social media, often in covert means, um, using covert agents, not identifying themselves as working for the uh, the government as being as spreading information or disinformation online. So this is not a new phenomenon, but it is worrying, and it is part of this broader Russiagate fabric that is being woven right now. And as you say, it brings in things like proper not and Hamilton sixty eight, which I know you go into your in in your report on the uh, Liberty Report about this topic. Tell us a little bit about Hamilton sixty eight, what it does, and who founded it. This is extraordinarily important because it's part of the German Marshall Fund, which is largely funded by the U.S. government. So this is the U.S. government funding an organization. Hamilton 68 is a dashboard for your Internet to let you know what the Russians want you to think about. So presumably you think about something else uh, or else. Uh, but the whole idea is part of an organization within the German Marshall Fund that's headed up by People like Mike Morrell. Mike Morrell is a pissed off guy because he was going to be the head of the CIA under Clinton. You know, he was the acting uh, CIA director under Obama, and he was going to be he was going to be tapped to be CIA head. And doggone it, how dare Trump win deprives him of his of his, of his you know the highlight, the peak of his career. But it's not only neocons like Morrell; uh, it's Bill Crystal. Bill Crystal is being his organization is being funded by the U.S. government to tell the rest of us who's propaganda and who is not. This guy with a track record of zero being right about anything, but with an enormous neocon agenda, these are the people behind the scenes who are being entrusted with telling the Americans what they're allowed to watch and what they're not allowed to watch. And uh, uh, James, I'm sure you've probably looked at it. The other characters involved in Hamilton 68 are just as bad. Chertov, uh, this creep who made a fortune uh, selling junky uh, metal detectors to the airports after he created the phony uh, uh, color-coded uh, uh, terror alert to terrify everyone. Uh, so this is a really uh, this is a very dangerous uh, uh, partnership between the nonprofit, uh, non non government sector and the government itself. Absolutely. And all of those characters uh, definitely need uh, more a scru scru uh, scrutiny and examination. And for people who are interested, just type in Chertoff Rapiscan into the Corporate Report search bar and you'll find my re previous reports on that swindle and all of these other characters. Bill Crystal, of course, should be laughed off the face of the planet by his, uh, I mean, uh, probably should be behind bars, but at any rate should be laughed off the face of the planet for the, uh, the, the, the predictions about the Iraq war and how all that was going to, to pan out. And of course, people are still listening to him because now the new narrative is that we are back in the Cold War. It is, it is head-scratching from a sane perspective, but I know that things have become insane in the American political context over the last couple of years, and up is down, black is white... Uh, left is right. All of this craziness has uh, turned the, the, the board topsy-turvy and people don't know what to do. And a lot of people are starting to uh, believe in these intelligence agencies that they once derided. And all of these things are, are now, we're, we're now seeing this. So I guess the question is, what do we what do we do about this? Is there an effective way to counter this disinformation campaign that's now being waged against pr essentially the independent alternative media um, on behalf of the U.S. government? It's, you know, it's difficult, James, because I, I, sometimes I imagine myself as, as a guy sitting in, in Germany in the early 30s and seeing all this mass insanity around me, people that are mobilizing in favor of this failed Austrian painter who promises them greatness and glory. But the only thing keeping them from it are these wreckers, are these, uh, these different groups of subhumans. And thinking to myself, something is wrong. Things are going nuts. Uh, this is crazy. What do I do? 
And I think we do have, we all have that feeling. Uh, and it is very difficult. I think the only thing we can do is try to fight through it, try to convince people. And I think we do have allies on the left and the right. They're fewer and further between than they had once been. Uh, but you've probably seen there's a great article by, by Matt Taibbi in Rolling Stone a couple of days ago. Uh, and he's certainly no friend of Putin. Uh, he knows about Russia because he lived there, but he's certainly no friend of Putin. And he's talking about how this Russiagate is being used to silence dissent. Uh, in in the U.S. and I think that is the key. Uh, the Ron Paul Institute, you know, we are absolutely transparent in our philosophical orientation. We're opposed to an aggressive U.S. military empire overseas. It's legitimate as an American, as a patriotic American, to have that view and to push that view. That's what it's all about. There are no hidden agendas. You know, Ron Paul has a track record of what forty or fifty years of public uh, of public education on the topic. So, but all of a sudden this, this thing we've been doing for decades is now something, uh, that is suspicious and it is, uh, uh, you know, something to be to struggled against. So, uh, the short answer to your long question, uh, to my long answer to your short question is we've got to keep fighting and doing the best and hoping the insanity passes. I think that is all we can do is continue to spread the real information because I do have faith that when people encounter truth, they recognize it for what it is. And when they encounter lies, they know that something is wrong and they can sense it deep down inside. And that's why we have to continue spreading this information while we still can in the way we still can, even on the controlled platforms, the Googles and Facebooks and Twitters, because that's where we reach the people who most are in need of this information. So my hat's off to you for continuing to do that work with the Ron Paul Liberty Report, with the Ron Paul Institute. Tell people about the work that you do and uh, how they can access it. Well, uh, we do a daily uh, YouTube, live YouTube at noon Eastern U.S. time, uh, youtube.com slash Ron Paul Liberty Report. Uh, we also have the Ron Paul Institute, ronpaulinstitute.org, where we publish and republish plenty of articles, thousands of articles a year, uh, plenty of uh, original material. We have big conferences every year in Washington, D.C. They're usually sold out. Great speakers. Last year we had Julian Assange as one of our speakers. So we are developing a beyond left-right movement to oppose the U.S. military empire that is threatening us at home, uh, bankrupting us at home, and making us hated overseas. It's so important that we do reach across whatever phony political spectrum aisles have been built up in people's mind, because this is more important than any of that. This truly, especially with this uh, warmongering against the, the other major nuclear superpower in the world, there's nothing more important than this. Potentially, it could be the end of human, the human species uh, as it exists. I mean, it's, there is no way of overstating the importance of this and the stupidity of this warmongering that's going on right now and people falling for it. So again, I will direct people to ronpaulinstitute.org so they can find out more about this and the work that you're doing there. Daniel McAdams, I think we'll leave it there for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, James. I'm a huge fan of your work. The Federal Reserve, the heart of the American banking system. For over 100 years, it has operated in the shadows, controlling America's money supply in total secrecy. So all that information is available uh, in our commercial paper. And program. who got the money? Hundreds and hundreds of banks. Any bank or that has uh, access to the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve's discount. Can tell us who they are. No. Until now. 100 years ago, in 1913, the Fed was created. Fractional reserve banking. The legal authority to do it. Takeover of monetary policy. Are conducted by the Federal Reserve Banks. They are banks. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. Century of Enslavement. The history of the Federal Reserve. Watch the documentary for free at corporatereport.com slash Federal Reserve and purchase a copy on DVD to help support The Corbett Report today.